distinguished speaker my dear colleague ladies and gentlemen a very good morning to all of you i am pleased to welcome you all on behalf of gel training institute noida for today's event i am thankful to all of you for connected virtually for today's program with me dr rs bhelumurkan general manager training and sri pc gupta chief manager total quality management department is present here at gti sakyam is a significant annual event which is organized jointly by petroleum conservation research association pcra and the oil industry under the aegis of ministry of petroleum and natural gas government of india with the sole purpose of bringing awareness among the people on the need for conservation of oil and gas and the means to do it this year the campaign is being organized with the theme green and clean energy from 16 january to 15 february 2021 during this period various activities are carried out in sectors like transport industrial agriculture and household to spread the message of on fuel conservation the campaign will also highlight the adverse health and environmental impacts of increasing the carbon footprints to celebrate sakyam 2021 gel is organizing number of event across the country to sensitize citizens on the need for energy conservation one of such event is talk show and panel discussion which is being organized by gel training institute noida in association with total quality management department related to the theme of sakyam 2021 green and clean energy so far gel training institute successfully conducted four different talk show on subject improved domestic cooking burner of png waste plastic for energy conservation and these both the topics covered by indian institute of petroleum dehradun then role of renewable energy in india's electricity sector in association with jarmi ahmedabad and prospects of biogas sector in india by indian biogas association and we have also conducted four panel discussion one is electric vehicle in association with iit madras second one is role of city gas distribution in clean and green energy by subject matter expert from oil and gas domain cultivation of sports in professional life by expert from sports academy association of india and last topic was on biofuels by subject matter expert from iitm delhi in today's panel discussion we are having dr sc sharma dr b bhargav and dr bk gupta from iitm delhi and the topic for today's panel discussion is hydrogen for automotive using electricity from solar and other green energy now i will request dr rs bhelumurgan ji to introduce the faculty and a brief on today's topic over to you sir thank you mr ji welcome and warm good morning to the eminent speaker present here dr sc sharma dr bargava and dr vk gupta colleagues across gail watching today's webcast ladies and gentlemen viewing the recorded session of the panel discussion on hydrogen for automotive using electrolysis from solar and other green energy sources it is my great privilege to introduce uh, today's speakers of this panel discussion uh, dr sharma is one of the few professionals in the country having worked with the government of india psus ongc petronet lng and the academic institution like iit bombay his 36 years of career is largely devoted to the growth and development of energy sector in the country dr sharma has worked extensively on formulation of national energy policies including market price for energy and oil and gas sectors he advised government of india on integration of energy petroleum sector value chain and its economics to develop a sustainable industrial infrastructure dr sharma prepared report on india's position on carbon emission sustainability for the country presents at cop 15 in copenhagen in december 2009 uh, Dr Sharma had been a member of number of global energy institutions like G20 clean energy ministerial UN energy sustainability group 
and bilateral energy cooperation with oecd countries including usa canada australia and europe uh, let me introduce our second speaker dr bargava he is a more than 40 years of experience in energy sector working in research laboratories industry and the government he is the main architect of national solar mission launched in 2010 Currently, he is associated with IITM and other organizations advising on research and other matters. He worked as Director General, ONGC Energy Center. Earlier, he worked in different capacities in the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. And he, he was also Director Power Solar Energy Corporation of India. He worked at Central Electronics Limited and National Physical Laboratory, Sagar University, and he holds PhD in physics. Uh, during the director, uh, Power is uh, worked on the development of various technology, including solar energy, hydrogen fuel cells, so on and so forth. Uh, it is pertinent to mention uh, his accomplishment that development of terrestrial uh, solar cell and modular technology for the first time in the country with safe space grade solar cells. Similarly, he worked in enhancement of gas recovery through microbial process, super hydrophobic coatings for solar cells and thermal spitting of water for hydrogen production. And he also published, uh, he is also having the uh, several national and international standards involved in transfer of technology for manufacture of solar models. He has written and also published papers in large number of international and national technical journals and conferences in, uh, in the area of solar PV and hydrogen production. Uh, our moderator of today's uh, panel discussion, uh, I welcome Dr. V.K. Gupta. He is extensively trained in Japan, has worked for 30 years at top management levels in large MNCs, including CEO, JMAM and JMA Group Japan. He has been providing consulting and training support to several leading Indian and MNCs for past three decades. He has been invited as distinguished faculty by IAM, IIT Delhi, ABS and other uh, international universities. He has published over 100 research papers in international journals and conferences. He is advisor and board member of many leading organizations. He has been conferred with several prestigious international awards and he is also a life member of India Energy Forum. And it's a today's panel discussion is going to cover on the topics like policy framework for use of hydrogen for automotive as initiative for green energy, technical aspects of hydrogen versus batteries for powering vehicles, initiatives and technology for production of hydrogen from renewable energy sources, economic aspects of hydrogen versus conventional fuels for automotive. Uh, with this, I am hand over the session to Dr. V.K. Gupta. Please uh, carry on with the session, panel discussion. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. L. Rugam and uh, Mr. Mishra ji. Uh, I'm very happy that we have with us two of my very senior colleagues, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Bhargav. Can you listen to me clearly, sir? Yeah, that's right. Are you able to hear me, sir? Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. So, uh, uh, we'll start with Dr. Sharma, and uh, he was with Planning Commission. So, a few questions I have for Dr. Sharma. Uh, why is there so much emphasis being given to hydrogen as a fuel or alternative to petrol and diesel and other fossil fuels? Uh, maybe one can look at the sources, different sources of uh, production for hydrogen. Is hydrogen a competitive fuel with petrol and diesel for transportation? Dr. Sharma, you may take about 25 minutes to address these questions, please. Uh, that's right. Uh, is my presentation visible to everyone now? It'll take a minute, sir. It'll come. Okay, just. Uh... Uh, yes, it is visible to us. Okay, right. Uh, so thank okay. you. Thank you, Gupta. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gupta, for that uh, uh, that introduction. And uh, basically, some of the issues which you have highlighted and the questions uh, uh, which you you have asked me, I would be answering through my presentation those questions. But uh, very important thing uh, 
which is uh, there in favor of hydrogen is that we need to reduce our carbon footprints and for that only we initiated the work of uh, reducing uh, carbon intensities uh, of uh, GDP by 20 to 20 percent, uh, 20 to 25 percent by 2020 and uh, uh, 30 to 35 percent by 2030. And that has been well documented as per the Paris Agreement. And uh, also now a report has been prepared by Ministry of Environment and Forest to implement uh, these targets. Uh, carbon emissions uh, are the, some of the major uh, issues uh, for human health and uh, the development of the country. And that's why I'm in this mission of uh, hydrogen um, as a part of uh, green fuel has been taken up by India. Now, what is happening is that uh, we do have uh, a largely transport fuel, industrial fuels, uh, or largely carbon uh, or the fossil fuels. And uh, to what extent we could reduce uh, these carbon emitting fuels by the green fuels, and in that context, only hydrogen has been considered. Now, recently, uh, on 1st February, the budget uh, 2021 has announced to launch a, a hydrogen mission to make hydrogen an accept, acceptable fuel for various commercial activities. Uh, number of agencies are also working globally to make hydrogen commercially viable fuel and to reduce the cost of uh, production of hydrogen from different sources. Uh, currently, the two sources of hydrogen are there. One is, of course, the uh, electrolysis process to produce hydrogen from water, and the second is, of course, to produce hydrogen from uh, natural gas for uh, from naphtha or uh, from naphtha for uh, refining process, as also to produce uh, ammonia and urea. So these are the two major uh, uh, areas for which hydrogen is currently being produced because 90, 90, 95% of hydrogen today available is uh, from the uh, fossil fuel sources. That's largely gas. Uh, we are in the process of uh, making uh, uh, the water electrolysis process also cost effective so that an ab abundant amount of hydrogen could be produced to meet the future demand. Uh, now, there are some questions. What's going to be the energy supply of the future? We are talking about renewable energy. We are also talking about hydrogen. We are also talking about uh, oil, coal, gas, and uh, nuclear and many other sources. So even biofuels are also part of a uh, good part of uh, fuel supplies today. Now, under all these uh, different supply sources, can hydrogen play a dominant role in future supplies? and which technology can make hydrogen a cost competitive uh, fuel with uh, other supply sources like oil and gas or coal. Reforming technology for hydrogen production from gas is one of the technology or solar power or RE option for hydrogen production as electricity could be another technology. Which uh, hydrogen is more viable, blue or green? The blue hydrogen is from the fossil fuels or the gas reforming. Green hydrogen is from uh, the solar uh, or uh, renewable, in, uh, uh, re re renewable energy or electricity for the electrolysis process of hydrogen. So these are the two technologies which are currently under discussion. And uh, let's hope that we make these technologies viable in the coming future. And a lot of work is going on. Now, India's hydrogen mission, as I said, the Union Budget uh, 2021 of India has announced hydrogen energy mission to be launched uh, during this year, 2021-22. Uh, at Ari Invest uh, conference uh, in November 2020, uh, PM had announced to launch uh, a comprehensive national hydrogen mission, and the efforts are being made to produce hydrogen energy from different sources, including green energy. Green hydrogen mission is essential to decarbonize uh, mobility, heavy industries like steel and cement. Hydrogen can be produced from many other sources like uh, bioenergy also, but emphasis is currently being made uh, to produce hydrogen from renewable uh, electricity sources uh, using water electrolysis process. Uh, 
are now need for hydrogen. 80% of current uh, uh, fuel supplies is from the carbon emitting fuels. And uh, obviously, I mean, for that kind of uh, carbon emitting fuel use, uh, the carbon emissions uh, have grown. Uh, in fact, if we have a look at uh, 2019 or 2018, the growth of carbon emissions had been around uh, uh, three to four percent, and we need to reduce uh, these growth to zero level. Label if we want to reach a, a carbon neutral future by 2020, we have to reduce our carbon emissions by about seven percent uh, every year till 2030 to have a better, uh, less carbon uh, atmosphere. The Paris Agreement mandated uh, to reduce emissions or emission intensities of uh, GDP or economy to minimize carbon footprints. And in fact, uh, to re uh, reduction of um, emission intensities of uh, GDP or economy has been mandated for uh, developing countries like India. Hydrogen being a zero carbon emitting fuel is being considered as a preferred fuel because it could uh, cater to the transport and other industrial usages. Uh, Reducing cost of uh, hydrogen production from the electrolysis process is one of the major uh, consideration for it to make uh, economically viable. Now, there are uh, certain properties, uh, the usages, uh, yes, hydrogen could be used in vehicle, trains, and all other uh, long range uh, transport applications um, and may compete uh, once its commercial production starts uh, with uh, other um, uh, carbon emitting fuels. Hydrogen may also become a competitive for the boiler applications and low carbon uh, building heat applications and many other um, uh, many other applications in industrial heating hydrogen can become viable to decarbonize some of the uh, some of the processes uh, low carbon and renewable uh, hydrogen may become uh, competitive with blue hydrogen used for the industry feedstock today as the costs fall and the carbon prices uh, and the carbon price as as the carbon prices rise. Now, just uh, give a little. I, I want to give a little idea that how different is the calorific value advantage on hydrogen. The Cole's cal calorific value kcal per kg is five thousand three hundred kcal, while uh, the hydrogen's uh, cal uh, calorific value is thirty four thousand one hundred and seventy eight kcal per kg. Uh, the diesel Kerosene or uh, the gasoline's um, uh, calorific value is around 10,200, 10,500 or 11,500 kcal. So the kind of uh, uh, thermal value hydrogen catches uh, is about three times of that of uh, other conventional fuels like uh, diesel and petrol and uh, about seven to eight times of that of coal. So the amount of carbon intensity reduction it would uh, uh, it would uh, really generate uh, would be enormous and uh, if uh, this fuel is uh, used let's say even uh, 25 uh, replacing 25 percent of carbon emitting fuel that can really give a huge uh, low carbon future uh, for the nations and uh, the planet as a whole now, the growth in uh, uh, global hydrogen production hydrogen has been uh, produced largely for uh, the refining and, uh, uh, and and ammonia production and uh, as of 2018 uh, a total amount of about uh, 74 75 million tons of hydrogen was produced uh, and majority of it uh, 95 percent of it was for uh, the refining and the ammonia production ammonia basically to produce urea for uh, as a fertilizer and refining basically what what happens is that uh, the bottom black residue which uh, remains in the refining uh, process that uh, basically is used uh, with uh, uh, the process uh, of hydrogen to improve its uh, light distillate yield and to improve its uh, improve the yield of petrol and diesel so that uh, the refining margins also improve there are uh, some other um, uh, technologies which uh, where hydrogen could be produced. Uh, methanol is one and uh, then uh, direct uh, reduction of iron is also uh, one of the area. And there are a number of other applications where uh, hydrogen is used as a clean flame fuel for different processes. Hydrogen, I mean, this is one of the process uh, about 75 million tons of hydrogen is produced uh, today from uh, uh, the natural gas or naphtha. 
which is uh, about 0.5 percent of the total global energy demand. But yes, this we have to really increase it in a big way. Natural gas is currently the primary source of uh, production of hydrogen by steam reforming process. Uh, steam reforming process established uh, is established commercial technology, and of course that's how I mean uh, this. Uh, is used uh, for both uh, ammonia production as well as uh, the product, uh, as well as uh, the light distillate uh, product upgradation and refining process. Uh, we, now, in fact, what happens is that 90% of the cases, hydrogen production and um, ammonia production, as well as uh, uh, the refining process, uh, hydrogen is produced from gas, but wherever uh, in some refineries or um, uh, ammonia plants, hydrogen is not available. Naphtha is used uh, to produce hydrogen and further uh, produce ammonia and uh, the light distillates. The second uh, is the electrolysis process, uh, including uh, solar electricity. In fact, uh, the electricity is one of the most, in, most uh, important ingredient to electrolyze the water uh, to separate the hydrogen at a high temperature. The cost economic plays a major role in deciding the hydrogen production through water electrolysis process. R&D is under progress to reduce the cost of electrolyzer and number of uh, activities are happening to reduce the cost of er electrolyzer and also to improve the efficiency of electrolysis process, which uh, would further make uh, hydrogen a cost effective. Uh, solar energy being considered as uh, the low cost energy is also being considered uh, for production of hydrogen through the process of electrolysis. Uh, now, this is uh, one of the slides which gives uh, that uh, what could be the cost of uh, hydrogen production from gas with and without uh, carbon capture and utilization and storage. Uh, now, if we have a look at where uh, the cost of uh, gas is low, uh, like in Russia, uh, Russia, uh, United States uh, and Middle East, the cost of uh, gas is much lower compared to the cost of gas in Europe and China. And uh, that's how I mean the cost of production of hydrogen from uh, uh, the natural gas is higher in uh, Europe and China, while in US, Europe and Middle East, uh, the cost of production of hydrogen is comparatively much lower. Uh, now, this is a comparison of uh, of, of uh, hydrogen production. Now, hydrogen production depends on the gas uh, gas price. If the gas price is, uh, let's say, $2 or $3, hydrogen production cost would be much lower. But if the gas cost is, let's say, 6 7 or $10 per million BTU, the hydrogen production cost would uh, go up accordingly. Now, this is basically to give a comparative uh, analysis of uh, production of hydrogen from uh, uh, the natural gas uh, with CCUS and with uh, the with the uh, renewable uh, electricity uh, using uh, the water uh, electrolysis process. Uh, now the cost of production under the electrolysis process is certainly higher compared to the cost of production from gas uh, uh, to produce hydrogen uh, because uh, yeah, the countries like Middle East. Uh, and Russia, they produce gas at a much lower uh, prices. Uh, also, Australia produces at much lower prices. That's why the cost of production is much lower. But yes, uh, the uh, the uh, electrolysis process to produce uh, hydrogen from, uh, from renewables is uh, yet to be matured, and it's to become more efficient and uh, cost reduction of electrolyzers to happen. So that's why the costs are uh, somewhat higher. Now, these, these, this is some of the roadmap which is uh, being given as to how the cost of uh, hydrogen production could be reduced with uh, different uh, label of uh, electricity charges and with uh, reducing cost of uh, uh, the electrolyzers. Uh, now, uh, the electrolyzers uh, cost uh, could, uh, capex could be $750 per kilowatt hour uh, going down to $550. Uh, dollars per kilowatt hour to going down to uh, 250 kilowatt hours. So the electricity cost also could uh, reduce uh, as we go forward and, uh, and, and the cost of uh, production of hydrogen could uh, range from $5.7 dollars per kg could go down to as low as uh, $0.6 dollars per kg and that makes hydrogen production much uh, more compatible, competitive compared to the 
current uh, generation liquid fuels. Uh, now, hydrogen not only needs to be produced, but it also has to be commercially transported to the user uh, sectors like we transport oil and gas to different uh, areas by pipeline, by tankers, by many, uh, by railways and all the other uh, sources of uh, transportation. Now, at the current uh, label of uh, trucking, uh, the liquid hydrogen or gaseous hydrogen or hydrogen from pipeline, uh, there are uh, a good amount of uh, cost comes uh, and uh, it is estimated that uh, uh, the transportation cost of hydrogen could be reduced as much as by 60 to 70 percent by 2030 once uh, the hydrogen becomes uh, commercially viable. Now these are certain areas uh, the capex could be reduced. Uh, let's say if we have a cost of uh, hydrogen uh, production at uh, six dollars per uh, kg, the capex could could be reduced uh, by about one point six dollar. Uh, the efficiency could be improved by 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 five dollar. Uh, there could be other cost uh, reduction and energy cost reduction could be around one point three dollars to make hydrogen uh, available at uh, two dollar. Uh, per uh, kg kind of uh, price, uh, which uh, could still be higher, but given the kind of uh, carbon uh, emission costs which are coming, carbon emission price which would be developing would make this cost uh, economically viable. Now we have uh, developed, uh, India has developed the clean energy project to mix hydrogen with CNG. Uh, that is a joint project by uh, uh, the IGL uh, and IOCL. And uh, the pilot project is using hydrogen CNG for uh, as a fuel in 50 BS4 uh, compliant CNG buses of DTC. The Rajgarh SCNG uh, production unit will supply fuel to the 50 CNG buses. Uh, uh, this compact reformer uh, will produce four ton of hydrogen every day from natural gas and will uh, and this uh, hydrogen of four ton will be, will be blended in a ratio of 18% hydrogen and the balanced CNG to run the DTC buses and this uh, the uh, trial project and the, of course it could be further upgraded to a commercial scale as in the, as the hydrogen cost reduction uh, takes place. As a concluding remark, uh, yes, hydrogen is a carbon free clean fuel to achieve carbon neutral future. A lot of work, a uh, lot of uh, uh, work is being done to make hydrogen an economically viable fuel for its use. Reforming technology is certainly well developed and commercially developed, deployed for, for over the last 100 years. Work is under progress to make electrolysis process uh, commercially viable. Creating hydrogen economy is uh, essential for developing a clean and uh, green fuels for the future. And uh, yes, uh, we hope that uh, and uh, we have a belief that yes, hydrogen uh, is a fuel for future as uh, uh, the global economies improve, the money money generation improves, the cost efficiencies improve. Uh, yes, so the hydrogen is going to become a more uh, viable and affordable uh, clean fuel for uh, the various usages in mobility, transportation and many other industries and even uh, as a use in uh, uh, households uh, for cooking or uh, the households for uh, uh, the lighting purposes. Uh, so this uh, hydrogen holds a great future uh, as a clean fuel and uh, would provide a clean and sustainable uh, future for uh, this generation and next generation once it becomes uh, commercially viable and uh, we hope that yes, uh, going uh, going by the current happenings, yes, hydrogen is going to become a major fuel in future. Thank you. Thank you. It's coming. Dr. Vikke Gupta, please uh, unmute your mic. 
So please thank you, thank you, Dr. Sharma. I think it's an excellent uh, overview, and uh, you have given a very comprehensive view of what uh, is already happening and maybe what you do in the future. But a lot of assumptions are there, and uh, we are now coming to Dr. Bhargav and make a request to him to give a little insight into the actual implementation part of it. So a uh, few questions I have for Dr. Bhargav. Is electrolysis, electrolysis the best option for India, especially to produce hydrogen from solar energy? What do you think hydrogen will cost, uh, will be cost competitive as a transport fuel? What do you expect from the hydrogen energy, energy emission and the recent announcement made during the current budget? Dr. Bhargav, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gupta, and good afternoon to all colleagues. Uh, basically, this you may topic, take about 25 minutes, Dr. Bhargav. About 25 yeah, minutes. Sir. This topic has four aspects. First, hydrogen to be used as a fuel. That means the other applications of hydrogen and methods to produce hydrogen for other applications that need to be separated. Second is the automated use. So there you have to see that how today's automobiles need to be redesigned or modified so that hydrogen can be used as a fuel. Third part is electrolysis process for production. Whether the conventional electrolysis process for production of hydrogen is best suited for hydrogen as a fuel or that needs to be modified. Fourth one is solar energy to provide energy or electricity. Do we have other options or solar energy is the better choice? Now, look at this. I need not go into the details of this as uh, Dr. Sharma has already gone through this. The only point I would like to emphasize here is as the society has developed over the decades. The carbon footprint is reducing. We started with fuel goods, coal, oil and gas, renewables. So eventually we may have to go for hydrogen as a natural choice with zero carbon footprint. <clears throat> Dr. Sharma has already talked about this. So all I would like to say is that hydrogen demand is large and it is growing rapidly. Details have already been shared. Now look at this. Various methods for hydrogen production and its application, they are listed here. Key point is there are two methods, one which use heat and other which use electricity. Heat is the one which is today already in commercial use on a large scale. So electricity is the other option where we have to see what can be done, especially when renewable energy sources have been developed and costs have dropped down to a level that using renewable electricity is more attractive than conventional electricity. <clears throat> and that's why electrolysis process for production of hydrogen that is being talked about. Now this is the process where electricity is split into water and hydrogen. Electrolyzer is used to perform this process. Basically there are three major type of electrolyzers, the EM, alkaline and solid alkaline. What are they? Polymer electrolytic membrane electrolyzer. In this electrolyzer is a solid specialty polymeric material. Now this is a key component which is used in these electrolyzers. Water reacts at the anode to form oxygen and positively charged hydrogen ions which is protons. Electricity flows through an external circuit and hydrogen ions selectively move across the PEM to the cathode. And you can see at the cathode the reaction takes place. <coughs> now this reaction takes place at about 70 to 90 degree Celsius. And the efficiency of the system could be as high as 
Now, depending upon the quality of the stacks and the system, the efficiency keeps varying. The other one is the alkaline electrolysis. Now, this is the one which is commercially available and widely used. In this, you can see the alkaline electrolyte uh, operate by transport of hydroxide oil through the electrolyte from the cathode to the anode with hydrogen being generated on the cathode side. This uses a liquid alkaline solution as the electrolyte. And this process is commercially available for several decades. But here if you can see, the temperature of the process is relatively high, about 150 degrees C. And the efficiency is relatively lower, so up to 70 degrees C. The third one, if you see, <coughs> which is another emerging option, which is reverse of a solid oxide fuel cell, that is solid oxide electrolyzers. This is a high temperature process, uses solid ceramic materials. This is the process which is still under development. Today, the efficiency of this process is about 50 to 60, and it is performed at temperatures like uh, 700 to 800 degrees C. This uses natural gas as the input fuel, but in this case, the efficiency could go higher than 80 percent also. <coughs> and that is the reason that uh, this process is also being looked into. And here also, you know, water is split into hydrogen gas and oxygen. This is, I just shown up a picture of a electrolysis plant in Japan where solar power is being used for the process. So, you know, the topic which we started with using solar energy to produce hydrogen that is depicted here. Now, <coughs> Look at this uh, pie chart. Today, roughly about 4% of uh, hydrogen is being produced by electrolysis. Largely, the natural gas that dominates. But the future productions are that by 2050, about 22% of hydrogen will be produced by electrolysis, 8% by biogas, which is missing in the first chart, and rest will be from natural gas and coal. Oil refineries, their direct contribution to produce hydrogen, that may go again. Now, why electrolysis for hydrogen production? You see, when electricity produces from hydrogen, renewables is available, hydrogen becomes a carrier of renewable energy, complementary to electricity. Electrolyzers can help integrate variable energy energy sources into power systems. You see, one of the limitations for feeding power to the grid for a renewable source of energy is that the power is not dispatchable. This can happen. So when you are using hydrogen as a source, it can be used as a source of storage of renewable energy. It can provide grid batteries, which otherwise is not feasible. So hydrogen from renewables is used, useful as a storage. It can be used as a transport mechanism for uh, renewables. So, electrolysis process for hydrogen production using renewables makes a lot of sense. And especially in the Indian context, when you know we have set up a target of 175 gigawatt by 2022 and 350 plus by 2030, the amount of renewable energy power that you will be producing, there will be a big issue in dispatching that power and loading that power to the grid. So if that power, when electricity is not used, is used to produce hydrogen, it can be transported, it can be stored, it can be used for grid balancing. So it will provide a stable grid to the country. Now what have we done? as a country in the area of hydrogen energy. You see, we started initial R&D as early as in 70s, where the focus was primarily in the academic institutions. But in later part of 90s, 
efforts were initiated to demonstrate the application of hydrogen. That whatever hydrogen was available as a bottle hydrogen in cylinders or in refineries, etc., that was used. And we started work on hydrogen generation, storage, fuel cells, and application in vehicles, etc., as well as you know, generator set being run by hydrogen. In early 2000s, these efforts are further strengthened, and that's where you know, oil and gas companies they also started working in this. IOCL was the first uh, oil and gas company which started working into this in early 2000s. In fact, you know, at that time, <clears throat> IOCL was the only company which had a full-fledged R&D center to work on alternatives also, other than the research for the oil sector. So that's where they got uh, roped into, into this. And the ministry, MNRE, in 2003-04, further decided to strengthen these efforts. Where we thought in the ministry that the time has come that other than academic institution, industry must also be involved. Because if hydrogen is to be used, in the automotive sector, you can't work without industry. If hydrogen is to be used as a fuel and it has to be transported and dispensed with, like uh, fuel dispensing, oil marketing companies, they cannot be ignored. So any integrated development that requires involvement of these sectors of industry, which are really infrastructure sectors. And with that idea in mind, MNRE decided to set up a hydrogen energy board in 2003-04. And uh, at that time I was working on this, I, I had the privilege to sign the first order of setting up of the board. As a part of the board, four components were there, hydrogen production, hydrogen storage, transportation and application. So the board decided to set up a steering committee that was under the chairmanship of Mr. Ratan Tata and Mr. Anand Mahindra. They were requested to come out with a working report which essentially led to the hydrogen energy roadmap for India. But the main advantage of that steering group was the industry started thinking right at that time that there is a need to create the ecosystem, to create the infrastructure. And what we popularly call as uh, hydrogen economy, the foundation is stone of hydrogen economy in India that was placed at that time. And as a result of the efforts and the iteration over the year, in 2006, MNRE released the hydrogen energy movement. And that further spurred the activities. So like, uh, you know, <clears throat> after MNRE, I was heading UNGC Energy Center. Energy Center started working on thermochemical splitting of water as early as in 2007, based on the initiatives taken by MNRE at that time. Finally, as a result of the cumulative efforts, this year in the budget, now, government has announced launching of the mission this year, though this work is going on for quite some time. Now, look at the spectrum of organizations which are working in India into this area. There are large number of academic institutions. Virtually every IIT is there, BHU, ICT, Pune University, ISC Bangalore, several NITs, Jawaharlal Nehru Technical University. Then very large number of government labs and private research institutions. They are also working in this. PARC is one of the lead organization. Various CSIR labs, ONGC Engineering Center where I was working. ARCI, NICE, this National Solar Energy Research Institute. <coughs> Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research. Their process CNR Rao is working on uh, uh, splitting of water using photocatalytic methods. 
then in the private sector, Aspect Science Foundation, they are working. They started working in the early 2000s. Then if you look at, at the industry side, Indian Oil, Tata Motors, Mahindra's, Ashok Leyland, Bajaj, BHEL, BTCL, Reva, RIEL, Gale, all of them they are working. Various government departments and ministries, MNRE, DST, MOPNG, DRDO, DAE, they are all working. Look at that. In early 90s, there were 10 institutions which are working. Now today we have more than 100 institutions in the country which are working in this area. Now, what are the challenges? If we really want hydrogen economy to be developed for India. First and foremost is cost effective hydrogen production, which uh, Dr. Sharma has uh, extensively dealt in his presentation. And Dr. Gupta had uh, also asked me to talk about, we'll touch about this. Then what are the alternatives to electrolysis? Especially when uh, electrolytic process is becoming more and more efficient and cost of electricity by renewables is declining. So like uh, most of you may be aware that in India, now solar power is available at 2 rupees per kilowatt hour, which is competitive to electricity cost in most of the countries elsewhere. Then what are the alternatives to solar PV? Wind is there, bioenergy is there, hybrid of wind and uh, solar PV is there, then solar thermal power is there. Compact and portable hydrogen storage. Because hydrogen being a very light gas, one kg of hydrogen is little over 11.2 meter. So that needs to be compressed quite a bit. So how are you going to deal with it? This is also one of the challenges fuel transportation and dispensing. If you produce centralized hydrogen, transportation is an issue. And dispensing is anyway required if you need to fill up the tank of a vehicle. Then, when we talk of vehicle, fuel efficient and cost effective vehicles, they are also required. A lot of work is being done and needs to be done. For a country like India, where we have a very large population of vehicles, including two wheelers, which run on IC engines. To talk about the electric drive alone is not economically feasible. So we need to consider ways and means to use hydrogen into IC engine also. Then of course, related safety issue, hydrogen is gas. When it burns, you can't see it. So you need to have better codes and standards to ensure such safety. Now we'll talk about alternatives. As I mentioned earlier, thermochemical splitting of water for hydrogen production is one method. Where what you do is you use chemical processes at uh, elevated temperatures, 500 degrees C to 800 degrees C to produce uh, and hydrogen and oxygen. The advantage of this process is that hydrogen is produced as a pressurized gas. So some of the investment which is required for compression of hydrogen, that is also taken care by this process. Now I'll show you some of the pictures of uh, one of the research plants which have been developed in the country for producing hydrogen by this method. This plant is set up at uh, Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai. And this is running there for last uh, three years now. And we have several international patents on this. You see, the other alternative which is attractive, and if you recall, in one of the slides I showed earlier, that 8% hydrogen production could be um, biological. So biohydrogen, this is one of the other options. This is uh, one of the plants which has been set up at IIT Kharagpur. So coming back to electrolysis, 
capital cost reduction, improving the efficiency. These are the two key challenges. And thirdly, as I said little while ago, integration compression into electrolyzer to avoid the cost of a separate hydrogen compression for increasing the pressure of hydrogen storage. That is also another challenge. And we have to go into this. Now talking about the storage, being a very light gas, hydrogen needs to be stored at a high pressure. And in countries like Japan, they have developed technology to store up to 800 bar. Whereas in our country, right now it is 300 to 400 bar. Liquid hydrogen that can be stored in cryogenic tanks. This is a standard method, widely used in research labs and space organization, as well as some of the industry. Now, solid state hydrogen storage. This is a very interesting method of uh, hydrogen storage. Metal hydrides, they are very attractive for this purpose and being researched for several decades now. In our country, in early 2000, BHU developed the process and uh, nickel metal hydride, they were developed, but the efficiency of the storage was low. Recently in Germany, Fraunhofer Research Institute, they have developed some magnesium based hydride. Now that is claimed to be far more efficient and claim that the energy storage is three times more than the lithium ion batteries. So that is one technology that needs to be watched. And if that becomes uh, successful on large scale, it gives answer for hydrogen to be used in transport vehicles without going for a dispensing station like you know dispensing of diesel or petrol etc. Then of course hydrogen pipelines, this is another method where our colleagues from Gale, they are the experts, they know how to do it, but it has its own limitations. Now what I would like to show you is some of the pictures of development in the country. <laughs> Uh, here you can see a hydrogen motorcycle and three wheeler. They were developed by BHU in uh, early 2000s. And the range of the motorcycle was 70 kilometers per charge. The storage was metal hydride. This metal hydride used 70 degrees C to release hydrogen. So, you know, fitting that metal hydride canister into the motorcycle, that was a technical challenge. Because if you keep it below the seat, it gets heated up slightly and not very comfortable to the driver. Now, the latest one, the magnesium based uh, storage, that reacts with water and releases hydrogen. So, I'm really excited to read about this. This is a very recent development and we must watch that development because that is going to be very good for uh, introducing hydrogen for uh, transport. Now this is, you know, blending of uh, hydrogen and CNG. You know, theoretically up to 30% uh, hydrogen can be blended, so, sorry, with CNG. But uh, what we have done is, a couple of vehicles were developed in the country where 18% hydrogen was blended and experimented, and it was found that emissions are reduced up to 50%, and overall efficiency is improved, and no significant change in the engine was required. Because if you use a pure hydrogen energy engine, it requires lot of change and redesigning of the engine. Otherwise, the efficiency of the engine reduces considerably. Now, this is the dispensing system. The first system that was put up at uh, Dwarka, sorry, at Faridabad in 2005. Next one was put up in Dwarka in 2009. Now, a 
larger thing is coming up at Rajghat uh, uh, for buses. Now these are the pictures of the system. Uh, I'll just interrupt uh, Dr. Bhargav. Yeah, uh, it's an excellent uh, presentation. So we'll come to this for a minute. I'm uh, just picking up. Yeah. So, so, data motors. Yeah, I would like to dis I would like to discuss this in detail if you can later. So just one or two questions with uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, Dr. Sharma, uh, we know that uh, we have seen the uh, way uh, how many years this uh, gas will uh, last. I mean earlier there were prediction of very very short time and uh, possibility of CNG and other natural uh, gas uh, lasting for a very very long time. Perhaps 200 300 years is what is predicted. So in that situation. Will people not go back to CNG and fossil fuel rather than spending, you know, so much money? Because hydrogen become really viable. I mean, today uh, with a lot of assumptions in the presentation. It come down to very low price. I think 0.6 uh, dollar or whatever. The question is to reach that will take a lot of time. And alternatively, people have have an easy option of using CNG as a clean fuel. So, what is your view on this, sir? Well, uh, if we have a look at uh, in order of uh, high carbon intensity, we have to first remove uh, coal from the system. The second uh, fuel which is to be removed from the system is oil. And the third is, of course, uh, the natural gas. Uh, now, natural gas uh, being a lighter fuel, also having a very high hydrogen content could be used uh, to produce hydrogen as uh, mentioned in Dr. Bhargav's presentation that by 2050, if uh, any hydrogen is to be produced, the large quantum about 35% of hydrogen would come from natural gas. Uh, now, if we have to produce uh, hydrogen from natural gas, uh, the best option is uh, to produce uh, hydrogen from natural gas at the source itself, wherever uh, the wherever the gas is produced there itself uh, uh, the carbon is extracted co2 is, is extracted uh, from natural gas and uh, c2 hydrogen c2, c2 c4 also you're taking out for petrochemicals perhaps at that stage you're taking yeah. c2 and uh, c5 also yeah that's right that's, that's, a, that's a different uh, process uh, uh, for petrochemicals but uh, if we want to produce uh, uh, hydrogen from natural gas we have to remove the remove the carbon, uh, that's uh, one carbon, and uh, make it carbon dioxide and 2, 2H2, the hydrogen, which is uh, removed uh, in the reforming process. Uh, now, that's the easiest process uh, and uh, the co most cost-effective process is to produce at the source of gas production and to transport it. Uh, but uh, you see what's happening is that uh, cost and price is our mindset. We have lived uh, in an era of $100, $120 per barrel of uh, oil prices, uh, where if uh, tomorrow, let's say next year, oil prices go to $100 per barrel, your uh, entire electrolysis uh, technology could become uh, economically feasible. Uh, now, those are the issues which um, are yeah, under consideration. And as yeah. to, to, to reduce uh, carbon intensity, of uh, emissions is uh, one of the major issues why hydrogen yeah. is uh, given. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Sharma. I'll come back to Dr. Bhargav again because uh, I was in Japan uh, in mid uh, 80s and again mid 90s, and I've seen the development of fuel cell and also experiments using a, a mixed, uh, uh, you know, IC engine using hydrogen at that time. So it is almost 25 years now, and uh, still we are experimenting. So maybe you can give a preview of. Uh, what, where are we on the fuel cell, sir? You're just sharing the last few slides, sir. Dr. Bhargav, please. Yeah. You see, what we have to appreciate is that uh, in the last decade, situation has changed drastically. Now look at the Indian scenario. You talked about CNG. The usage of CNG was marginal unless the Supreme Court of India decided that that would be fuel for transport in a city like Delhi. Now that infrastructure is there, ecosystem is there, cost has declined, safety has improved. Same is going to be in case of hydrogen powered vehicles. Now, as far as the mixing with CNG is concerned, you know, this is essential to create the 
infrastructure. The gas dispensing stations, CNG, if they mix hydrogen, they are getting sensitized how to handle hydrogen in significant quantities. So this will happen over a period of time. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for that. I think fuel cell was one perhaps last slide. You can just share that. Uh, give about two slides back. Yeah. Because fuel cell is a very promising area, and I think a lot of work has gone into that. That makes it a very compact uh, mechanism for using hydrogen for automotive, particularly. True. You see, a lot of work is being done on fuel cells in the country. See, BHL was the one which set up a 200 uh, kilowatt PAFC fuel cell plant for power generation in 2002. Ispix Science Foundation, they started working on PEM fuel cell for electric vehicles as early as in the late 90s. Several organizations are working, industry is working. Reva, they developed an electric car and then retrofitted it with fuel cell from Ballard's. That was also in early 2000. Now, fuel cell bus has been developed by Tata's. IUCL is also involved in that. So basically, the ecosystem is developing, but it is slow. So with the launching of national hydrogen mission, what will happen? It will accelerate these efforts. Look at solar mission. When solar mission was introduced, 2010 cost of solar power was 17.85 rupees per kilowatt hour. Today it is 2 rupees. So somewhere what you have to do is, you have to start coordinated efforts to develop the infrastructure, set up the target so that volumes are created. And once that happens, cost will start declining. So we are at that stage now. Yeah, th thank you very much. I think uh, we really had a very comprehensive view of the hydrogen economy and uh, for automotive and other uses. And a lot of development is taking place. Perhaps with this new uh, energy, uh, hydrogen mission, uh, it will speed up. And maybe we can see another 15 years, 10 years, 10 to 15 years time, uh, hydrogen being used extensively like CNG is being used today. I think Dr. Bargo and uh, Dr. Sharma have been very clear that uh, it will take its own time and uh, pace will depend on Overly, the you know ultimately end of the day it has to make uh, business sense to anybody to go in a big way. R and D is okay, but it has to make it commercially viable. That's the key point. So thank you very much for both of you, sir. And uh, back to um, Dr. Wellberger, please. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Gupta. Now I request Pritam Chan to propose what of thank. You. Thank you very much, uh, Bali sir. On behalf of corporate equipment department, yes. it is okay, my pleasure. Pleasure to extend vote of thanks on today's panel discussion on hydrogen for automotive using electrolysis from solar and green energy. I would like to express my gratitude and respect to eminent speakers, Dr. S. C. Sarmasab, Dr. V. Bhargav, and Dr. V. K. Gupta from International Institute of Technology and Management, Delhi, for sparing their valuable time and enlightening us with their knowledge, experiences in new era of energy sources, <clears throat> that is uh, mission of hydrogen in India and globe, uh, <clears throat> uh, automotive in, uh, and industry also for commercial uh, use of commercial vehicles, trains and long range transport <coughs> applications, etc. Uh, I wish to express my gratitude to team GTI in order, BIS, department to organize this very interesting topic uh, in Satcham 2020-21, which is very much relevant. I also wish to thank everyone who involved directly and directly to organize this program. My heartfelt thanks to all Gale employees who joined this webcast from various sites across Gale. Once again, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.